So you're probably thinking, Caitlin, do we really need another video of you going over every single Barbie movie and explaining the lore behind each one? Um, and the answer is yes. Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin and welcome back to my channel. So a little while ago I got a DM on Instagram asking if I could point them in the direction of like a Barbie movie crash course. They wanted to watch something in preparation for the new movie that kind of summarized all of the animated Barbie movies that they hadn't seen yet. And how I took that request was I was like, oh, okay, cool. So you're asking me to do that. Um, and so that's what we're doing today. I'm sorry I'm a bit behind. I wasn't able to get this video up before the new movie came out, but I was like, you know what? It all works out because now at the end of this video, I can add in my thoughts on the new movie. It's also raining because of course it just started raining really hard right when I started filming. And so I apologize being here that I am fairly close to a window, but I don't think it'll be that big of a deal. Um, I also am hoping that you guys can notice a bit of a difference in the quality because I did get some brand new lights for this video and for the rest of my videos moving forward. And I'm so excited. I feel like they look so good. Even if you think it looks bad, please just tell me it looks good because that's all I wanna hear. All right, cool. So I have created a slideshow to aid me in this task because there are quite a few movies that we're gonna be going over today. I believe I have just over a hundred and, oh no, it's up to 151 slides now so that's great i'm excited i'm ready and so let's just jump right into it all right so a guide to the barbie cinematic universe made by me so first of all my qualifications how am i qualified to present this topic to you guys today well first of all i was raised on them fans of this channel will know that the princess and the pauper has always been my favorite but i also went through a huge magic of pegasus phase like i had all of the merch i dressed up as annika for halloween one year and i even had like the pegasus wings that you'd put on your back so that you yourself could become a pegasus i was just obsessed and honestly still am obsessed to this day. I've also seen all 42 movies and more and you might be thinking, Caitlin, what more could there be? Well, don't worry because we're going to be going over everything today. And I've also been making Barbie movie content since 2018. So this really is not my first rodeo. So first up, let's go over a timeline. So this is a very rough timeline. We will be going into more detail throughout the slideshow. So obviously we start in 1959 with the creation of the first Barbie doll. And then we go all the way to 2023 with the release of the first live action movie. Movie. So let's start with 1987 because we're not really here to talk about the dolls We're here to talk about Barbie in like a media form And so the first time she was seen on our screens was in 1987 for a TV special called Barbie and the Rockers out of this world and its sequel Barbie and the sensations rocking back to Earth. And so the first Barbie movie Barbie and the Rockers followed Barbie and her band the Rockers post sold out world tour and Barbie's not too sure what she should do next until she has the marvelous idea of being the first band to host a concert in space as a way for her to promote world peace of all things because of course it's Barbie. The movie is only like 30 minutes I feel like um, but I liked it. I thought it was cute. I liked all of the songs in it. I have a picture here of the doll line because I do want to cover the dolls as well throughout this video, but obviously I don't have any of the dolls from this line. And this also is actually a photo of the reproduction from like 2016 or something like that. Um, but yeah, cute movie. I'm glad that I finally got the chance to watch it. And then, like I said, it was followed by the sequel. So Barbie and the Sensations, rocking back to earth. So this one picked up right where the last one left off. And it had sort of like a 50s theme, which was fun because it was all about like them traveling back home to earth, but then they accidentally end up time traveling back to the 50s. And the way in which they explain this happening in the movie is just one of my absolute favorite things. From what you told me, somehow the position of the planets and the musical chords you played triggered that time tunnel. Like, Yes, of course the notes in which they were playing and the alignments of the planets would force them to time travel. Like that just makes perfect sense to me. And yeah, I actually like this movie even more than the first one, probably just because it had such an outlandish concept and I usually gravitate more to the ones that have like more out there plot lines. Um, but yeah, it was fun. I liked it. I'd recommend checking it out. I feel like people oftentimes complain about the fact that both of these movies are included in like the official Barbie movie lineup, but that mainly just comes down to the fact that they are TV specials and not movies. But nonetheless, this was the first time we saw Barbie Barbie like on screen properly. And so then that brings us to 1999 with the Toy Story franchise. So I didn't include these movies on like my timeline because I definitely see them as like their own sort of thing, but I still feel like when you're talking about Barbie in movies, you should include these ones. So that's why I did. And so obviously Barbie was seen for the first time in Toy Story 2, which came out in 1999. And then she was also in Toy Story 3, which came out in 2010, I believe. Oh, and she was also in the short film 
Hawaiian vacation. So in Toy Story 2, we saw some Barbies partying it up in Al's toy barn, and then when Andy's toys need directions, tour guide Barbie hops in their vehicle and helps them out, and then we also see a Barbie at the end of the movie as a way to like taunt the villain in a way. And then she comes back in the third movie and she's given a bit more of a prominent character in this movie. Basically, Molly finds one of her old Barbies and so she donates it to the Sunnyside daycare. And then when Barbie gets to the daycare, she ends up meeting a Ken doll for the first time. And yeah, she's really iconic in this movie and we love to see it. But all of this brings us to 2001 because enough about Pixar, like we're not here to talk about Oscar nominated and probably won films. We're here to talk about true art, which is of course the straight to DVD uh, Barbie movies. So there are 42 movies to date. Our series starts back in 2001. And obviously since there has been so many movies throughout the years, the series has gone through many changes and we're gonna be talking about all of them. And so our first wave of movies all kind of follow a similar format in the fact that they were all adaptions of classic stories. So we have Barbie and the Nutcracker, Barbie as Rapunzel, Barbie of Swan Lake, and of course, Barbie, Princess, and the Popper. And so those are like our first four that we're gonna be going over and then we'll go into the second wave. So obviously let's begin with Barbie in the Nutcracker. Okay, so this movie follows this girl named Clara who after an encounter with this evil mouse king from this other world, ends up getting shrunken down to the size of a Christmas ornament. And so to become her regular size again, she has to go on this adventure into this other Nutcracker realm to find the Sugar Plum Princess. But then in the end, she finds out that she was actually the Sugar Plum princess all along or was she because then the whole thing ends up being a dream as we see her wake up in the end and it's like oh wait that was all a dream but then was it actually a dream because then the prince who oh by the way <laughs> we also find out that the nutcracker was actually the prince plot twist and so he comes in the real world and it's like hinted at that they know each other so maybe it actually all wasn't a dream and it did happen it just kind of felt like a dream I'm not really too sure. <laughs> and so obviously this movie was based off of the ballet of the same name. And so it had many ballet numbers throughout it. I would say the most memorable ones would be the ones that happened at the end of the film between Clara and the prince and then the comic relief characters Actually, they weren't really comic relief characters, just this scene was very comedic for me as a child, um, but it was the dance between Major Mint and Captain Candy, some of their friends that they met along the way. Another notable thing about this movie is that it began with Barbie telling the story of it to her younger sister, Kelly. And this was a common theme throughout the first three movies, which is that Barbie was telling the story of this movie to her to help her out in some way. And so in this movie, she was helping her out with her ballet routine, I believe. Also moving forward, every Barbie movie following this one has a nutcracker hidden in there at some point as like a little Easter egg to pay homage to the movie that started it all, which I think is really sweet. I feel like sometimes he's more noticeable than others and I have not been able to spot him in every single movie, but still I really like that they do continue to do that even to this day. All right, on to Barbie as Rapunzel, one of my personal favorites. And so this movie starts off with Barbie telling the story to Kelly as a way to like inspire her, I believe, because she's like not really too sure what she wants to paint. And so she's like, let me tell you the story about Rapunzel. And so the story follows Rapunzel who is trapped in this castle in the woods that's hidden by this like magic barrier. Rapunzel finds this magical paintbrush that her parents left to her that works as this like teleportation device. And so she uses that to go into the village. And this is when she meets the Prince Daniel, but she doesn't know he's the prince at first. But anyways, they fall in love. And yeah, the whole movie is like a conflict because you have like these two kingdoms who are fighting with one another because the one king thinks that the other king stole his daughter, but then it actually wasn't the other king. It was the evil mother Gothel who has been holding Rapunzel captive. And she's been holding her captive because she was in love with one of the kings and then he didn't reciprocate that love and so when he got married to someone else she was like oh i'm gonna steal your kid because that should have been my kid and i just feel like that whole plot line alone is one of the many reasons why i love this movie so much because it like doesn't really make much sense like why would the one king blame the other king for stealing his daughter when he has no proof in regards to that whatsoever and then for her to go to such extreme to be like i'm gonna steal that kid like, I just feel like it's iconic and one of the many reasons why this movie is so good. Another reason why this movie is so good is because of its amazing sidekick. So we have Penelope, who has always been one of my personal favorites. She's like Rapunzel's little pet or just like friend dragon that lives with her. And she is just so adorable and I love her so much. And she's just like this insecure little dragon who wants to impress her father. And I love her. She's the best. Um, but then there's also Otto. So he is the sidekick to the evil Mother Gothel. And he is just this like slime ball little otter who's like constantly moaning and groaning throughout the film. Like the amount of noises that come out of his mouth like throughout this movie are not necessary, but they just make it so much better that you can't help but love him. Give him to me. Uh, oh, allow me, mistress. Mm. <laughs> 
Next we have Swan Lake, another one of my favorites, even though I feel like I'm gonna be saying that for like most of the movies on this list. Nonetheless, Swan Lake is also very good. And so this movie starts off with Barbie telling the story to Kelly while they're away at sleepaway camp. And I believe it was as a way to like help her feel better about being away from home. So this movie follows Odette and she goes on to discover this like enchanted forest after following this unicorn that ran into town. And so in this forest, she meets the fairy queen and also all of these little elves. I think they're elves. They're Kellys, <laughs> but they're supposed to be elves, I think. And they have been turned into animals by the evil villain Rothbart, who is also trying to take over the whole forest. And then it turns out that Odette is the chosen one um, after she's able to pick this crystal out of this rock. And then the movie goes on, Odette is like, I can't be the chosen one. And then Rothbart turns her into a swan and she's like, oh, I guess I have to be the chosen one because I don't want to be a swan forever. And then she ends up meeting the prince because of course she does. And the two fall in love and it's the power of true love that they have for one another that ends up defeating Rothbart and saving Saving the forest forever. So this movie is also based off of the ballet, so we get a lot of really pretty dance numbers as well, like the one in the forest between the prince and Odette that they have during their like date, I would say. Um, and then there's another really good one between Odette and the fairy queen when they're getting ready for the ball. But I absolutely think the best dance by far in this movie is the one that Odile, who is the daughter of Rothbart, has with the prince at the ball when she is posing as Odette. It's just this really beautiful scene where it's constantly flipping between what the prince sees, which is her as Odette, and then what reality is with her being Odile and whatnot. And it's just such a pretty scene and definitely one of the best ones from any Bart movie, I feel like, to this day. So I also just wanted to talk about Rothbar and Odile because they are probably one of the best Bart movie like villain duos that exist to this day. They're so funny, but like unironically funny. Like they're not intending to be funny, they just are. And now I have to break Rothbard's spell somehow. Well, well, well. <gasps> Ooh, my days are numbered. I'm shaking in my boots. The girl. Quiet! But oh my god, that brings us to Barbie and the Princess and the Popper. So fans of the channel will know that this movie is my personal favorite, so you better believe I have a lot to say, so get ready. So we have our two main leads, Princess Annalise and the Popper Erica. They were both born into very different lives, as Annalise is the princess and Erica is a pauper. So she is an indentured servant to this seamstress Madame Cart. And so that's her big conflict in the movie, whereas Princess Annalise's conflict comes from our villain Preminger. So he is the queen's royal advisor, but he's secretly doing evil things. And so he has stolen all of the kingdom's gold. And so the queen decides as a way to like stop the kingdom from going under, she'll marry her daughter off to King Dominic because his kingdom is very wealthy. So Preminger does not like this idea of Annalise marrying this other king because then it ruins his plans of becoming king. So he decides to kidnap Annalise. But then in comes Julian, who is Annalise's tutor and also love interest. And he was there when Erica and Annalise met. And so he decides to conduct this plan of having Erica pose as the princess while he goes and tries to figure out what Preminger's got going on because he's suspicious of him. But then things end up backfiring once Julian and Annalise both get kidnapped and then Erica gets imprisoned, but everything works out in the end once Julian and Annalise are able to escape and reveal Preminger's plot. Um, so yeah, that was Princess and the Popper. <laughs> I love it very much. And one of the standouts of this movie is obviously Preminger. He is probably the most iconic Barbie movie villain to this day. Like I don't think anyone will ever be able to top him. He is just so funny and sassy. He's voiced by Martin Short. So that's probably one of the many reasons why he is so beloved. And yeah, just like his line delivery and just everything about him, I feel like is so iconic and he is the best. I must be off to see to the <laughs> arrangements. It says she's run away. <gasps> What's this stupid cat doing here? Get out of that bed! <laughs> ah! Next week! Why don't you stick to your books, schoolboy? Well, I'll send out search parties at once, Your Majesty. I'm sure she couldn't have gotten far. I also love all these sidekicks in this movie. So Princess Annalise and Erica both have their own cats. Wolfie is Erica's and he barks. So that's great. And then Serafina is Annalise's and she's just this prissy little princess cat. And the two of them end up falling in love and having a bunch of little kittens. Like what's not to love? Uh, Preminger also has a dog, but he's not really that like notable. I would say the more memorable sidekick on Preminger's part would be his horse, Hervé, 
who is French, because why not? Um, I love Hervé. He's the best. He also ends up helping them in the end, which just is one of the many reasons why he's so good. Another reason why this movie is so good is because of the ships. So like I mentioned, we have Princess Annalise and Julian. They're like friends to lovers excellence. But then there's also Erica and Dominic. So Dominic is the king that Annalise was set to marry. And so when Erica came in and posed as Annalise, the two ended up falling in love. And it was just so adorable. And I love them so much. Erica, even after at the end of the movie, once she's able to go on and live her dream of being a singer, she decides to come back so that she can be with him and that just makes me really happy and then the two of them go on to have a double wedding and it's like what's not to love about that just iconic um and then we also have a slide that i made for julian just because i wanted to give him some love because i feel like i don't oftentimes give him enough love so this is me <laughs> giving julian some love i have some julian memes there because he is just so good this is also the first movie that featured barbie bloopers and i still feel like to this day this movie has the best blooper where julian breaks out into a break dance during to be a princess speaking of to be a princess one last thing before i move on actually no i have two things before i move on the first thing is the music in this movie i don't know if i mentioned but it's a musical and so that's one of the main reasons why this movie is so good is because it's a musical and all the songs are amazing i feel like the most memorable memorable song from this movie is probably A Girl Like You. Like even if you've never seen a Barbie movie in your life, you've probably seen memes of this song because it's just iconic. Um, but then I also wanted to mention that my personal favorite song is A Cat's Meow. I've ranted about how much I love this song in the past, um, but I also love If You Love Me For Me. And then I also included Free because I feel like that's another very iconic one from the movie. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about the dolls. And so I'm just gonna talk about like one doll per, um, era and so i think i have eight in total or something but for this era i wanted it to be the princess and the popper dolls because they were just so iconic so let me grab them okay here's annalise and erica they were really pretty and i love them and one of the cool features about them is that they would sing a song together and i don't know if it's queued up but i'll give it a try i also don't know where the button is oh i found it okay no <laughs> okay well when it is queued up they sing together um a girl like you so let's let's try to get that there we go and that was just such a fun little feature that they did that i still love to this day and they're so beautiful like the attention to detail on these dolls don't focus on luna focus on annalise <laughs> And Erica, thank you. Um, like just the attention to detail on these dolls are just unmatched. And you'll see moving forward that like not all of these dolls have that. And so that's this era, iconic, beautiful. Okay, so this brings us to 2005. So we have four movies to cover in this era. And this is when they decided to kind of abandon the whole adaptation route and instead do like their own original stories, which we see first with Barbie Fairytopia. So this movie follows Alina, who is this fairy that was born without wings. And so once this magical evil potion gets spread across the land that causes all flying things to not be able to fly anymore and get sick, it is up to Alina to save the whole kingdom of Fairytopia. As you know, she's never had wings to begin with, so she she is strong enough to do it on her own. And she does, which is great. I would say the most memorable thing about this movie is obviously Bibble. Again, I feel like even if you've never heard of a Barbie movie in your life, you've probably come across this guy on some corner of the internet. I think I have to go to fairy town. What? Will you be okay without me? We're close now. We'll be fine. I have wings. Bibble? You can't possibly go all by yourself. I won't. I'll be with Bibble. Okay. Yeah, Bibble. Bibble, you'll stay here and look after him, won't you? No. So he is Alina's puffball. I believe he's her pet, but he could also just be her friend. I'm not really too sure. Like, you can't really explain Bibble. He just kind of is this powerful entity in and of himself. He just like speaks gibberish and is adorable and we all love him and praise him. That's Fairytopia. Next we have my very beloved Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus. So this movie follows Princess Annika who is a princess and she loves to ice skate. So that's like her quirky thing is that she's an ice skater. And then she's not allowed outside and we're not really too sure why her parents are so protective and they don't really want her to go anywhere. And then we come to find out that it is because of the evil 
um, sorcerer, I'd say. <laughs> sure, the evil sorcerer, Wenlock. One night when Annika is out skating, Wenlock flies on in his griffin and he's like, you need to marry me. And Annika's like, what? I'm not gonna marry you. And then he turns her whole village and her parents into stone. And then he says, you have three days to marry me or else they stay stoned forever. And so Annika's like, oh no, what am I gonna do? And then in swoops in this Pegasus and she takes her off to Cloud Kingdom. And they decide to go on this quest to find the Wand of Light, which is this magical wand that is capable of defeating Wenlock and his evil magic. And so along the way they meet Aiden. He is arguably the best Ken character out of all these movies. I love him so much. And the banter that him and Annika have throughout the movie is just so good. Like they're enemies to lovers, excellence. Whose bright idea was it to come here? Only fools come to the Forbidden Forest. And yet you're here. I don't see her. Who? My bear cub. Let me guess, your cousin? The gem of ice is somewhere up there. I can feel it. And can you feel how we get there? And yeah, I've gushed over him before in my Ken video, which you can go watch if you want to see me praise him even more. And so yeah, they fall in love. And then also we do find the Wand of Light, obviously, and they do defeat Wenlock and it's all big, happy ending. But we also discover that that Pegasus I mentioned that saved her, turns out she's actually Annika's long lost sister. That's right. When she was her age, she was also approached by Wenlock and he was like, if you don't marry me, I'm gonna turn you into a Pegasus. And she's like, I'm not gonna marry you. And then he did that. I actually don't think he told her that's what he was gonna do. He just did it. She's been living as a Pegasus her whole life. And so then once she and Annika are reunited and the Wand of Light is a thing, she's able to use the Wand of Light to turn Brietta back into her human self. What a ride. <laughs> Oh, I love this movie so much. Um, oh yes, another thing I wanted to talk about with this movie is Shiver. Uh, she's like Annika's little polar bear sidekick who I feel like a lot of people hate, um, probably rightfully so. She's kind of annoying and causes a lot of problems for them throughout the movie, but I just have so much nostalgia attached to her that I just can't hate her and I love her. And I just wanted to talk about her because look how cute, she's so cute. This was also the first 3D Barbie movie and I'd say probably the only one. I don't think any Barbie movie has attempted to do 3D before. Was it a bit of a gimmick? Sure. Sure, but it was still fun and also the game on the Barbie girls website with it. I remember loving follow the light um, Also Brie Larson sang a song for this movie. Uh, it was called hope has wings and I love it It's one of the best Barbie movie songs She also went on to perform it in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which I think is a fun little fact Okay on to the next movie, which is our sequel to Fairytopia Barbie Mermaidia. Oh, I just noticed that my vine fell down It's on Bluey's head. Has that been down this whole video? I feel like it has. I'm gonna fix that. Here we go. That's better. I like the vines. And I want them to be up and present. Okay, Barbie Mermaidia. So this movie follows Alina, and this time she has to give up the wings that she earned in the last movie for a tale so that she can save the kingdom of Mermaidia as their prince Nalu has been captured. So some memorable characters from this movie, we have Nori, this is the mermaid that helps Alina throughout this whole movie. And then we also have this snail who has kind of gone a bit viral recently for her amazing line delivery once she was asked to open her shell for them. Excuse me, but would you please uh, open your shell for us? Open my shell? But of course. And then of course again we have Bibble. Like any movie that gives us more Bibble content is a win in my books. She's gone. Come on Bibble, eat up. Ew, yeah. <laughs> And there's this great scene in this movie where he's trying all these different berries and getting like different voices and it's just very good. Um, but yes, like I mentioned, we have this Prince Nalu and he is kind of like at the center of these two girls is like conflict because Nori is in love with him, but they're just friends. And then she also sees Alina as a threat, but that's not where the real love story is at. The real love story is between Alina and Nori as they are in love as far as the fans are concerned and their chemistry throughout this movie is just iconic. And so I have some fan art of them here because I just had to talk about them and how in love they are. I also wanted to do Alina for this era because her doll is just gorgeous. So let me get her. Okay, so here she is and she is amazing. I'll give you guys a close up. Beautiful, beautiful doll. She also has rooted eyelashes, which I love. And this is her in her mermaid form. But the fun thing about this doll is that she also transforms into her fairy form once you pull this tail off. And then there you have it. She's her fairy form as well. And it's just such a beautiful doll. And I remember having her as a kid and I was obsessed. And honestly, I still am obsessed to this day because like, look at that, that's so pretty. And like, we just don't get this type of quality 
with the dolls moving forward, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So let me put her away and then we will continue. All right, so next we have the Barbie Diaries. Now this movie is very different from the rest of the movies in this franchise. It follows Barbie as herself in high school and they're kicking off their new school year and they want this one to be very memorable. And so Barbie wants to be a news anchor, but then her rival Raquel ends up getting it instead of her. And so then she decides to go like full on Mean Girls and join the popular crowd so that she can write a story on popularity. She's also in a band, so we get some fun songs through that. And then there's also uh, her love interest, Kevin, who is probably like one of the worst love interests out of any of these movies. Like he's definitely a creep. And if you want to hear me talk more about that, you can go check out my Ken video in which I talk about him. But yes, obviously this movie is very different. It was geared to a bit of an older audience. And that is mainly because it was around the time when the Bratz franchise was like on a run and doing great. And so this was Mattel kind of like playing into that as it was very popular around this time to like appeal to a bit of an older audience. I feel like this movie hasn't really aged as well as some of the other ones, mainly due to the fact that it chose a different animation style that some would only be able to describe as horrendous. But if you look at it in comparison to what Bratz was doing at the same time, it definitely makes sense as to why they chose this route for this movie. And so that ended up giving us this movie as well as the next film series that we're gonna talk about, which is My Scene. So the My Scene franchise began in 2002. And like I said, it was a response to the whole Bratz phenomenon. We didn't get our first movie until 2004, but we were still seeing them in like a visual way as when the dolls were released they were also releasing webisodes onto the website and they were basically just little quick stories that followed the girls doing various things in regards to like fashion or dating and whatnot and I was just obsessed with them as a kid oh also I feel like I didn't really explain well why we're talking about my scene my scene is relevant because Barbie is actually in this doll line and so this is like another universe in which Barbie exists in as herself. So that is why we're talking about it. They also released games on the website that I feel like were very memorable to me and a lot of the other people that grew up with my scene. And they were just such great marketing tools because it really made me want all of the dolls, even though I did not have any of them. Okay, so the first movie came out in 2004, like I said, and it was sold alongside the dolls. And so you had to buy one of the dolls to get the DVD. And it basically followed the girls traveling to Jamaica for their guy friends band as they were competing in this Battle of the Bands competition. And then also some relationship drama takes place as. As well. It definitely has a very similar feel to the Barbie Diaries, probably because they have the same director. I also don't have any of the My Scene dolls, and so I included photos of them because I love every single one of these doll lines, especially the Jammin' in Jamaica one. Like, if I could have any of these dolls, it would probably be these ones because they are so pretty and I love them so much. Okay, so then we have Masquerade Madness. So this movie followed the girls putting on this masquerade fashion show to raise money for this local animal shelter. Again, I have the dolls pictured here and as you can see, that's how they sold them. So like the DVD came directly inside the box again with this movie. Once again, the dolls are very cute and I wanted them. Another notable thing about this movie is that it was featured in the shopping spree game on the Mycene website. And so that once again was just 10 out of 10 as far as marketing is concerned. Our last movie was also I feel like their first full length movie. Like I feel like their last two ones were only like 40 minutes, whereas this one was 70 minutes. So they were like, go big or go home. They also have Lindsay Lohan in this movie and they released a doll to go along with it. Um, it basically followed the girls being cast as extras in this Hollywood movie, but then one of them, I believe Madison ends up getting a starring role and then the fame kind of gets to her head and they all kind of have to bring her back down to earth. And yeah, I feel like that's all I have to say about this movie. Oh, I do like the fact that it's called My Scene Goes Hollywood, and yet they do not go to Hollywood at all whatsoever. The movie is filmed on location in New York, which is where they live. So they don't have to go anywhere, but they still called it Goes Hollywood, which I think is kind of funny. That actually wraps up the My Scene series. And so it brings us right back to our main canon timeline with the Barbie movies in 2006. And so this is the era in which they decided to kind of go back to their fairy tale roots as they do do a couple more adaptations in this way, but then they also create a couple more original stories as well. First of all, we have the 12 dancing princesses. This one is definitely a fan favorite and I'm excited to talk about it. So we follow these 12 princesses who are kind of a bit of a handful. They're all kind of quirky and outspoken and creative and whatnot. And their dad is getting a bit concerned because they're not proper princesses as he feels like they should be. And so he calls in his cousin Rowena for help to give them etiquette lessons. But then this ends up backfiring as cousin Rowena is actually evil. And so she comes and she starts poisoning her brother so that she can take over the throne. And so amongst all of this, the girls end up finding comfort in this book that their late mother left to them about this princess who discovers this magical land and they come to discover that this story is actually real as they also have
have a magical dance pavilion land hidden under their bedroom as well. And it is through the magic that they get from this dance pavilion and, you know, the power of sisterhood and working together that they're able to save their father and stop cousin Rowena from being evil and taking over the throne and killing their dad. And so this movie is also a ballet centric movie. We get a lot of great dance numbers, but my personal favorite is the one between Genevieve and Derek. Genevieve is like our main Barbie character in this movie and Derek is the girl's shoemaker and then they end up falling in love and it's really beautiful. And so they share a dance near the end of the movie that they do to dance their way out of the pavilion. And it's just iconic. Um, they also get married. Um, and then I also just had a little picture here because Preminger is in this movie. <laughs> he's not actually Preminger. I assume they just reused his animation model for this one. And he's just like this random guy that comes and is like, your kids are too rambunctious. They need to be proper. And so then the king's like calls Rowena and puts the whole thing into motion. But I just had to mention that Preminger is in this movie. And this is also a thing that we see moving forward, which is them reusing character models for the other movies. This movie also features one of the best songs that wasn't on the Princess and the Pauper soundtrack, uh, which is Shine. It is one of the best Barbie movie songs, hands down. And also the 12 Dancing Princess like instrumental theme is just so beautiful and very nostalgic. And so yes, that brings us to Barbie Fairytopia Magic of the Rainbow. This is the third and last Fairytopia movie in the like original franchise. And so I like to describe this one as like the Harry Potter of the Barbie Fairytopia movies. Basically, Alina is chosen to be one of the apprentices that are going to perform the annual flight of spring and create the first rainbow of the season. I personally feel like this one is the weakest one in the Fairytopia series. I just like really don't care for it and oftentimes forget about its existence. Um, but it's another movie in which Bibble exists. And so any movie in which we get more Bibble content, I feel like is a solid film in my books. Um, he also has this whole like subplot where he meets this other puffball and they kind of like fall in love. Or maybe they're just friends. I don't know. I feel like Bibble should be on his own. He doesn't need a love interest. He is too iconic. Um, and also there's this whole thing with like the tooth fairy, like he loses his tooth. Next up, we have Barbie as the Island Princess, another musical. So this movie follows this girl named Ro who was in this shipwreck and then deserted on this island in which she was raised by the animals there. And then we have Prince Antonio. And so he comes to this island, meets Ro and is kind of like in love at first sight. And so he brings her back to his kingdom and the two of them end up together despite all odds. Like, trust me, everybody is pushing these two apart, but they still come together and prove that true love reigns supreme over evil. <laughs> I also had to include this meme because I feel like it's very iconic. Iconic. It features Tika. She's the elephant on the left and she is um, Ro's friend in this movie. And I feel like she's kind of hated within the Barbie movie community because she's very annoying and just doesn't want to let Ro do her thing. Everybody's like me, but nobody's like me. Let's go home, Ro. And now for you. Why'd they animate her like that? Why does she look so ugly? <sighs> oh, I also forgot to mention that at the end of this movie, it's revealed that Ro is actually a lost princess as her mom is the queen of this other kingdom. And you might be thinking, is that really that relevant? And the answer is yes. Moving forward, we will see a lot more Lost Princess plot lines and Ro was kind of the catalyst of it all. So like I said, this movie is a musical and I just personally feel like the songs in this movie don't really compare to The Princess and the Pauper besides these two, which is I Need to Know and Right Here in My Arms. Those two are masterpieces and I love them very much. The rest of the songs in the soundtrack, I just personally don't really care that much for. Oh yes, so we also have probably the most duplicates in this movie out of like any of the Barbie movies. Um, a lot of character designs we saw again in this movie. I think all of the princesses from the 12 Dancing Princesses are in this movie. Um, you can also see Julian there just smiling away. And then I think that guy over there is the page from the Princess and the Pauper, but I could be wrong, but he's from something. And then you can also see Preminger again in the background, just smiling. Um, and then also the 12 Dancing Princess's dad is like the wedding officiant. And then also Princess Genevieve's dress is seen in one scene as well. Um, and so yes, that is The Island Princess. Let's move on to our next movie, which is Barbie Mariposa. So this was our first like Barbie Fairytopia spinoff. It starts off with Alina telling the story to Bibble of Mariposa, who is this butterfly fairy from Flutterfield, and her queen one day gets poisoned. And so it's up to Mariposa to go find the antidote and save her. And so she does just that. This is the doll I decided to choose for this era because she is gorgeous. Let me get her. Like, come on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> She's so pretty. Look at her. Focus on her. How gorgeous is this doll? I love her so much. She's so big. She's such a statement. I usually have her on display 
in the, oh, you can't see what I'm pointing to, in that bottom shelf. I used to have her on display on my wall, but she also can put her wings down and have a bit of more of like a understated sort of moment. And so this is her with the purple wings down. Oh, there. This is her with the wings down. And then you can put her arms up and then press the button in the back and they pop back up again. How fun is that? She's just so pretty and I love her so much. And another one that I feel like is just one of the best Barbie movie dolls. So that's why I had to choose this one for this era. It just was inevitable. Also, I love the prince's Spanish accent in this movie. It is very exaggerated and I like it. The way he yells, Mariposa. It gets to me every time. It is the royal guard. They're after me. I swear, Gastros, if you are behind, what happened to my mother? Oh, <gasps> Mariposa. Andreas, what's going on? I am so sorry. I don't mean to startle you. Lord Castros! Ah! All right, so next up we have The Diamond Castle, another fan favorite. And so this movie does an interesting thing because it goes back to the original movie's storytelling sort of intro, but this time instead of her telling the story to Kelly, she's telling it to her sister Stacy as a way to help her with some friend drama. And so she tells the story of the Diamond Castle, which follows Liana and Alexa, who are best friends that live in this cottage in the woods where they sell flowers. And so one day they are given this mirror in which they discover has a woman trapped inside, and then they go on this whole quest to find the Diamond Castle before the evil Lydia finds it and claims it for herself. I feel like one of the most memorable things about this movie probably today is the fact that people kind of see it as like a lesbian cottagecore film because you follow Liana and Alexa and the movie is all about their connection and friendship and just like them living in a fun cottage in the woods surrounded by flowers is just very appealing to people and honestly I agree with them. I feel like Liana and Alexa are in love. There are love interests in this movie. It's these two twin guys that really aren't that relevant and don't really do that much throughout this movie and were honestly unnecessary. Like if they weren't there, I feel like it would have been even more canon as to the fact that these two are gay and in love. But even with them there, I still feel like that is canon in my mind. This movie is also a musical. My personal favorite song from it is We're Gonna Find It, but I feel like the most iconic one is probably the English version of Tenerte Creerte by RBD, better known as Connected in English. Also notably, recently the puppies from this movie, Liana and Alexa's dogs that they find along their journey, went a bit viral on TikTok for the dance that they share at the end of this movie. And I think that that's really funny and I love that for them. Moving on, we have Barbie in A Christmas Carol. So this movie goes back to the whole storytelling intro. We have Barbie telling the story to Kelly um, after she says that she hates Christmas and Barbie's like, what? You can't hate Christmas. Let me tell you the story of a Christmas carol. And so she tells her the story, stars Eden Sterling, and she owns this like opera house, I believe. And she's being a big Scrooge. She doesn't like Christmas and she's gonna make all of her employees work on Christmas until she is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. And she changes her ways. I think it's a fine Christmas movie. I didn't watch it as a kid, so I don't really have any nostalgia attached to it, but like, is okay. Up next we have Thumbelina. Now I do not like this movie. I do not think it's okay. It kind of like annoys me because I feel like if it was a real adaptation of the Thumbelina story, it would have been so much better, but instead they decided to take a real modern route with it, which just confuses me. Like really the only thing the two Thumbelina stories have in common is that they both center a small girl. Like that's literally it. Um, but anyways, this movie follows Barbie telling the story to a group of campers, I believe. Um, and it's basically about these Twiller bees who are being threatened by um, this construction company. And so the Twiller bees end up bonding with this little girl and they save uh, their land from being bulldozed. And like, I get it. It's like an environmental movie and it's great. I'm all about saving the planet, but I just feel like the animation is horrendous. And I wish we could have had more of that like fairy tale magic that I feel like the early Barbie movies did so well. And it would have been so easy to just stick the source material and give us an actual good Thumbelina adaptation. But instead we got this movie, which I just feel like is not very good, but that's just my own personal opinion. If you like it, the more power to you. Okay, next we have Barbie and the Three Musketeers. Another, I feel like, fan favorite. So this movie follows our girl Corinne. She dreams of being a musketeer. If you don't know what a musketeer is, they were basically just like soldiers to the king. And so they were only a male-led role. And so Corinne dreams of being one, but it's like, that can't happen, she's a girl. But she travels all the way to France, goes to the castle, and then she ends up becoming a part of this like secret female musketeer crew, and then they end up stopping an evil plot against the king in the end of the movie and end up being the musketeers that they always dreamed about being. There is also a love story in this movie. It's not really that notable. Uh, the dude kind of sucks and we don't really care that much for him, but it was there. This movie also has a couple songs. I feel like the most memorable one would be All For One 
but I feel like there was a couple more as well. They're not really my favorite songs. I feel like this movie is definitely more stronger in the fact that it is like a feminist led Barbie movie and I love that for it. And so now we have reached 2010. And so while this series has had a few different changes throughout the years, this is when the series saw its real first overhaul. And we kind of say goodbye to our beloved fairy tale stories that we have come to know in this era. So we're gonna go over these first three before we jump into the other ones because I feel like these three almost serve as a trilogy. Like they're also intertwined and we'll talk about why when we get into it. So first up we have Barbie in a mermaid tale. So this movie follows our girl Merlia who is a surfer and then some weird things start happening to her. So first of all her hair starts turning pink and then she discovers that she can breathe underwater and then she is visited by this dolphin who talks to her. All of this leads her to discover that she herself is part mermaid and her mom is the queen of Oceania, the mermaid people, and it's up to her to go to Oceania and save her kingdom, which she does. She ends up doing this and it's great and she is reunited with her mermaid mother. An iconic thing about this movie would probably be the villain sidekick Alistar. Um, he went kind of big on TikTok recently for his iconic side eye that he has in one part of the movie. But yeah, he's just like this grimy little fish that I feel like is another beloved sidekick within the fandom that I'm not gonna lie, I did kind of dirty in my sidekick video, but it is what it is. You can't change the past. You can only learn from it and move forward and give Alistar the respect he deserves. Um, but yes, that is A Mermaid Tale. And I did want to include the Merlia doll for this little era because I personally feel like she's the last like genuine Barbie movie doll we've gotten, but that's just my opinion. Here she is. This is Merlia in her mermaid form. She is so adorable. I'm not actually sure if it's focusing on her or not but I hope it is. <laughs> and this is her in her mermaid form, like I said. She had this fun thing where like her hair would turn pink and water and like she would get these different tattoos like on her stomach and whatnot. Um, I feel like over the years it doesn't work as well as it used to, but that's okay, I still love her. Um, and so she could also turn into a human just by flipping up her little tail, I believe. Let's see if I can still do this correctly. <laughs> Okay, so this is her in her mermaid form. She's got her little hoodie on and legs and I also like how she's got little flip-flops I feel like that's so cute and yeah great doll. I love her and unfortunately like I said kind of goes downhill from here But that's okay. Let's wait till we get there to really talk about it for now Merlia is great and we love her So then we have the movie that really changes things which is Barbie a fashion fairy tale So up until now Barbie has been an actress in for the most part all of these movies besides the few exceptions that I mentioned because Every other movie Barbie has been playing a character That's why the titles have been Barbie as so-and-so or Barbie in so-and-so because she's just an actress She is just there portraying a role Which is also why all of the main characters have different names that aren't Barbie but in Barbie a fashion fairy tale She is herself and we see this in the beginning of the movie when it starts off with her on set of her newest film which is going to be Princess and the Pea which we actually never end up seeing because it's just used for this movie. So this movie follows Barbie's actual life and in her actual life she's really struggling with this whole actress thing. She's not too sure what's going on and then Ken ends up dumping her and so then she decides to travel to Paris to see her aunt Millicent and then she ends up saving her aunt's fashion company. And so then the movie ends with this grand fashion show with Barbie and Ken storming on in to say that he didn't mean to break up with her and it wasn't really what it was. It was this whole plot with Raquel and they kiss and get back together and it's this very beautiful iconic ending and I feel like one of the most memorable moments of this film is that ending fashion show the whole reveal with Barbie in this beautiful glittered dress and then Ken running in it's just so good and also just Ken throughout this entire movie is so good he's on this quest to find Barbie in Paris and it's just one of those classic things where everything keeps going wrong and it's just so so good <laughs> I also wanted to give a special mention to the fairies in this movie. So we have Glimmer, Shimmer, and Shine, I believe are their names. And they are these magical fairies that Barbie finds in her aunt's office, I think. I feel like they were just chilling there, maybe in the attic. I don't remember the lore, but she finds these fairies and they have the ability to make anything sparkle and so they use them for their fashions. And I think it was like they gain energy from good designs so that they can only glorify good designs. So like when the villains steal them and try to make them glorify their outfits, they're like, no, we can't do that because we're not inspired by your work. And I just feel like that whole concept in general was just so good and I loved it. There was also a couple good songs in this movie like Life is a Fairy Tale and Get Your Sparkle On, both very iconic and good. Oh, this is also the first movie in which Kelly Sheridan does not voice Barbie. So they replaced her with an actress named Diane in this movie. Um, two fans upset, but we will get to that in a little bit. Up next, we have Barbie in A Fairy Secret. 
So this movie starts off with Barbie on the pink carpet of one of her new movie premieres, and then later on, Ken ends up getting kidnapped by fairies and forced into this marriage to this fairy queen. So it's up to Barbie and also Raquel to come together and join forces and help save Ken. And honestly, he is one of the best parts of this movie. He's so funny and just everything with like him being captured and like forced into marriage when like he's loyal to Barbie and obviously does not want this marriage at all is just so good. <laughs> La la la! And then also the whole thing again where you have Barbie and her antagonist coming together and having to work together is great and another common Barbie trope that we will see more of moving forward. Okay, so now we reach a new era in 2011 and so this is when they decided to drop the whole actress Barbie thing and go back to the movies that she's starring in and we also see our first Barbie and her sister's movie in this wave. And so first up we got Barbie Princess Charm School. This is another fan favorite, iconic film if you will. And so this movie takes place in like this universe in which it's a modern day, but there's also a monarchy. And so within this monarchy, this school exists that all of the royal family and ladies in waiting and whatnot, I feel like have to attend to become like proper royals or whatever. And so every year they host this raffle where one regular civilian gets to go and attend the charm school for free. And so in this movie, we follow Blair, whose younger sister enters her in the raffle and she wins. So she goes off to attend Princess Charm School. And then we also come to discover that she is actually the long lost princess as well with a big reveal at the end of the movie um, but also if you've been keeping tabs on Barbie movies up to this point it's not really that big of a reveal and it's quite obvious but still a great moment I feel like a main takeaway from this movie is Portia <laughs> she's very iconic and beloved within the fandom she's like the mean girls sidekick and she's just she thinks differently than most do and I love her so much how dare you look Delancey they're serving floor cakes the floor cake was delicious Portia the palace. Can you even imagine it? I grew up in the palace, Portia. I live there. Oh. I didn't know people made clothes. I thought they came from elves. You know, like toast. You stepped on eight of my toes. I only have four left. You stole my cake. Not me. Blair. How dare she? I wanted that cake. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've been kind of harsh on Princess Charm School in the past, just because I feel like it hasn't been as good upon rewatches, but I do still like it. I feel like the concept is really strong. I like to say it's kind of like Hunger Games meets The Princess Diaries. And I don't know, lately I've been trying to just not rewatch the ones that I feel like don't hold up as well and just like focus on like the positive nostalgia memories that they give me instead. And I feel like that is a good way to do things. Oh, I also wanted to do her doll for this era. So let me get her. Okay, so here's Princess Blair. I'll give you guys a close up of her. So this is kind of when we start to see the quality decline a little bit. She's not that bad. She does still have like articulated um, knees. So that's great. Uh, the arms no longer have articulation. Um, the hair is not as great quality as we've seen previously and just, Yep, she's got a plastic top, which I don't love. Um, but she does have this fun feature where she has this little... Why are you focusing on Luna? Focus on me! <laughs> so she has this little thing in her back that you twist that brings her skirt up like this. And then you can put this little top on her so that she is like her um, school version, like the Blair that goes to the school before she discovers that she's a princess, right? And then you press this button on her back that's above the little turn. Oh, I guess I should take this part off first. <laughs> Anyways, as I was saying, you press the little button on her back and then bam, she's Princess Blair once again. Um, and yeah, I feel like I don't hate this doll. She's cute and whatever. I just personally feel like the quality just isn't there and it's definitely more focused on the gimmick than like the quality of the doll itself. Don't get me wrong. I feel like this era of dolls definitely had some good ones. Like I'm looking now and I feel like the Mermaid 2 doll was good. The Princess and the Pop Star doll wasn't too bad either. Um, but yeah. This one's not that great, so <laughs> that's that. Moving on, we have Barbie in A Perfect Christmas next. So this was the first movie in which we saw Barbie and her sisters at the head of it. I'm sorry, like if you enjoy the Barbie and her sisters franchise, that's great, more power to you. But I personally feel like it's the weakest series within the Barbie movie series. Like I just don't really care that much for the Barbie and her sisters movies, but that's just my personal opinion. Take it or leave it. I also don't really see the sisters movies as being in the same universe as the other movies. Like I guess you could argue, especially that 
this one is because we do see Aunt Millicent again and she is the same Aunt Millicent as like fashion fairy tale but for me it's just hard to connect those two Barbies as being the same thing because the sisters movies just feel so different to me but it's up to you guys if you want to see this as being in the same universe or not um, but there is also the question as to like if this Barbie is the same Barbie as like the Barbie from like the really early movies in which she was telling the story to her younger sister, Kelly. I personally feel like it's not because in this movie, Kelly is now replaced with Chelsea who are basically the same character. They just changed her name for like relevancy sake. But I feel like that would be a good argument as to why they aren't the same universes and why the sisters movies exist kind of on their own plane of existence. But anyways, I feel like I need to jump into this movie because I've been talking about this for too long. So this movie follows Barbie and her sisters on the way to visit their aunt Millicent in New York for Christmas, but then their flight ends up getting canceled and they end up stranded in this small town in like Arkansas or something and so they're at this like little inn and then they decide to put on this big show for Christmas and then even their aunt is able to make it and so it does end up being a true perfect Christmas after all. This movie is also a musical so there's that. I feel like this movie is kind of hated within the fandom like I don't think it is one that's very well liked. I personally don't have a problem with it. I watched it a lot when it came out because my sister was at the age and I feel like it's a fine Christmas movie. I definitely have some nostalgia attached to it but yeah I feel like that's all I have to say about a perfect Christmas. So moving on up next, we have Barbie and Mermaid Tale 2. I personally like this one better than the first one, but then there's also the fact that I haven't really watched either of them that recently. So take that with a grain of salt, I guess. This movie follows Merlia and her friends in Australia for a surfing competition. And while there, they meet her like rival Kylie and she goes on to get coerced by Alistar to steal Merlia's necklace and become a mermaid herself and then gets trapped by the villain from the first movie. And it's up to Merlia and Kylie to come together. You see that? <laughs> that common theme. Uh, they have to come together to defeat her and save Oceana once again. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about Remo last time. So I included a little slide for him here because I love him so much. He was like the sidekick to the villain in the first movie, but then in this movie, he's really only in one scene, but it was very memorable for me. It was the intro to the movie where he gives like a little summary to what happened in the previous movie. And yeah, I love him in the first movie and I love him in this movie. So I just wanted him to have his own slide because I feel like he deserves it. Kelly Sheridan is also back to reprise her role as Barbie in this movie and she will continue to voice Barbie up until 2016, I believe. And the fan wiki says that she was brought back due to an uproar at her being replaced in the first place, but I wasn't really able to find anything that like confirms that that is the reason why she came back. I feel like I do question it a little bit just because like, I don't know, this movie is a sequel and in the first movie Kelly voiced her. So I wonder if they brought her back to do the sequel and then they just like stuck with her because Kelly's great. She's the voice of Barbie as far as I'm concerned. But then I also feel like that's giving them a bit too much credit because because I don't really think continuity is really on their mind as we'll see later on once we get to the Mariposa sequel, which Kelly voices uh, Mariposa in that movie, which doesn't really make sense because in the first Mariposa, she does not because she's voicing Alina in that movie. Um, and so yeah, it's hard to say that continuity would be a reason for them bringing her back, but who's to say? Up next, we have our first Princess and the Popper remake with Barbie the princess and the pop star. Now, I feel like a lot of people like this movie. I personally have my gripes with it, but I feel like my gripes mainly come down to the fact that it's a remake of my favorite movie and I personally feel like it disrespects it in every way, but that's just my two cents. Anyways, this movie follows Princess Tori and pop star Kiara. They're both upset with their lives and they don't wanna do the duties that they have to do. So the princess has to write this speech that she doesn't wanna write and Kiara has to make her new album and she doesn't wanna do that. And so they both see the other girls' lives and think they have it better off. And then once they meet, they decide to switch places. And that's kind of where my gripes with this movie come from. It's just the fact that like these characters are supposed to be based off of like Annalise and Erica, whereas Annalise and Erica were like well-developed and like their struggles were real struggles. Whereas these two girls just feel like really ungrateful and don't wanna do like the basic things that they need to do in life, which just, comes across as like whiny and unlikable in my own personal opinion. There was also this whole thing with like this magical diamond plant that was like the kingdom's wealth. Like that's how they, I guess, fed their people was through the magical plant that produced diamonds that was guarded by these fairies. And so there's these villains in the movie that are trying to steal this plant because it's a diamond plant. Um, and so they got to stop him from doing that. Like I said, this movie is also a musical, but I personally just don't feel like any of the songs are that good. And then there's also the fact that there is a cover of To Be a Princess that I feel like if Julian heard, he'd be rolling over in his grave. Wait, <laughs> did I just kill Julian? Uh, no, sorry. He would not roll over in his grave because Julian is not dead. He's very much alive and well, but maybe he would drop dead if he heard this song is probably where I was going with that analogy.
Anyways, they ruined to be a princess in this movie, but one thing they did do good was the song Here I Am. I love it. It's a bop and I, yeah, I don't know. Say whatever you want about this movie, but you can't deny that that song is 10 out of 10 and I love it. Okay, so now we take a pause from covering the movies to talk about a little animated series that came about during this time, which is Barbie Life in a Dream House. So this is a short series that was released on the Barbie website and then later on Netflix and YouTube as well. It was shot like a reality series and so there was like a shaky camera at times and they did like a reunion episode and there was no laugh track, even though there was many funny moments in this show that I feel like probably would have warranted a laugh track. Um, but also I'm glad that there wasn't one because that would have been odd. Anyways, it was great and I loved it. And so so many other fans loved it as well. So the series followed Barbie and her family and friends during their various adventures in fake Malibu. Of course, there was also a doll line released, which I don't have any of, which is why I included a photo of it there. Um, but I wish I did. Like this doll line looks so iconic and they do look like really good quality. And from what I've seen, they're all articulated and the fashions are really good and their faces are well sculpted and just like everything about it seems amazing and i do one day hope to own one of these dolls but who knows what time will entail anyways i feel like the most memorable characters from the series would have to be ken raquel and ryan Although I'm not really too sure about Ryan, but I just personally love him so much that I just had to include him. So starting off with Ken, one of the reasons why he was just so good in this series is because he just really understood what it meant to be a Ken. My Barbie sense, tingling. I got it, Barbie. Ken, I need you. I live for those words. Seven, six, Barbie sense is tingling. Four, three. Commander Ken, what are you doing? Barbie needs me! And then there's also this one really great episode in which he discovers that his main role or calling in life is just to be Barbie's boyfriend. And he's 100% okay with that. And I just feel like it screams iconic. And I just love him so much. He's a real source of comedy in this show. And he, yeah, he just delivers as far as being a Ken is concerned. And then we have Raquel, who is our antagonist in this show. And she just strives every day, time and time again, to be as good as Barbie, but constantly is failing. And she's so like sassy and rude, but it's okay. Like she can be because she is like the antagonist. She's Raquel. So like Raquel can do whatever she wants. Like Barbie is kind of constricted to like her perfect persona, whereas Raquel isn't. So she can do whatever. And I feel like that's one of the main reasons why so many people have resonated with her character throughout the years. What's the fun in life if I can't compete with Barbie, trade insults with Nikki, and scheme and plot the way I was born to do? Kelly. Right? It's Chelsea. The plan is Barbie gets stuck here and misses the show, and I swoop in and strut my signature moves on the catwalk. Less talking, more tanning. Another Robert's family dream. Crush. Huh. Pool party at Barbie's, huh? I've got better things to do. I really don't. Stop that. No, Barbie. Hey, everybody, get a load of me. And so then we have Brian, who is kind of like Ken's nemesis in this series. And so he is also after Barbie's heart. So he's constantly trying to win her over. And he is also a musician. And so oftentimes he tries to do this through song. And it's just amazing. I love him. He's my personal favorite character from the series. And so I just had to talk about him. Oh, he's also Raquel's brother. I don't know if I mentioned that, but he is. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was the humor in the show, because like I said, the show is so funny. And I feel like it's one of the main reasons why it still holds up to this day. This show just did such a good job of like playing into the Barbie lore and like what playing with these toys as a kid was like, like the way that they would hold things would be doll accurate and their joints would like click as they move. In the first episode, we see Barbie have like one of her own styling heads in her closet. That's really funny. They would constantly make jokes about all the jobs that Barbie has had throughout the years and not knowing how old she is. And just like with the various characters that they introduced throughout the show, it just was obvious that they were really able to use the show's source material to its full extent. I also couldn't talk about Barbie life in a dream house without mentioning Ken's schlan poofa. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. <laughs> that wasn't for you then. Oh, also a couple audio snippets from the show have gone on to be like popular sounds on TikTok that you might recognize, like the uh, I'm winning speech or I win speech that Raquel gives at the beach where she's like, I win. And it's like the slow-mo music and the whole to the salon bit from the makeover episode also went viral on TikTok as well. Um, and so yes, now we go back to our main arc with the movies. And so now we're up to 2013. And I personally feel like at this point, the direction in which the series was going was kind of unknown 
unknown. Like in a way they were trying to go back to their roots with like the fairy tale stories, but then they also still wanted to do the whole modern thing. And so it kind of just left me confused as to like what to expect from the series from here, but let's just jump right into it. So first of all, we are starting off strong with pink shoes because this is my personal favorite from this era. In this movie, we follow Kristen, who is a ballerina who puts on this pair of sparkling pink shoes and then is transported to this ballet realm, mainly a uh, Swan Lake and Giselle. And so that's the main reason why I do like this film because Giselle is my personal favorite ballet and this movie introduced me to it. Now, one of the reasons why I do enjoy this movie is because of the humor in it. And that mainly comes from the two princes in this movie who are constantly fighting for Kristen's affection. Uh, for my Jane the Virgin fans out there, one of them is played by Brett Dyer. And so that is also a fun little thing. Giselle and I milked our first cows together. Remember Giselle? I got you your first bucket. Ah, oh, oh, not the face, not the face! Yeah. I'm not getting married. I'm only 17. 17? Better late than never, my sweet. You don't look a day over 16. But there are two things about this movie that I have to mention that I did not like. The first being the whole lesson of like, just basically ignoring your ballet teacher and doing whatever you want just doesn't really hit with me. Like there's this one scene in the beginning of the movie where Kristen doesn't follow her routine and then she gets scolded by her ballet teacher. And I'm like, yeah, fair enough. But then by the end of the movie, she goes on and does the same thing, but in her like final performance. And then instead of getting in trouble for it, a scout ends up choosing her to star in her own ballet production. And I'm just like, I feel like that's not the right lesson we should be teaching young girls, which is like not listen to your teachers, do whatever you want and you'll be rewarded for it. Like you just gotta follow your heart. Like yes, in some senses, following your heart is good advice, but maybe not in ballet. Like I would disagree that that would be a good lesson. And I just don't understand why that was the route they wanted to take this movie in. My second complaint I have about this movie is that it features Swan Lake and yet there is not a single reference to Barbie of Swan Lake in this movie. Like how hard would it have been to like throw Odette's dress on like one of these girls? Like, not that hard. You could have done that. Or like, put the swan in there. <laughs> put the swan with the crown and then I'd be happy. But no, you didn't do that. And so now I'm upset. But on a happier note, you know what? They have a great song in the end of this movie. It's called Keep On Dancing, um, which is a common thing in this era of movies. They have like one song per film. That's like really good. And I don't know, I like that. Okay, moving on, we have the sequel to Mariposa, which is Mariposa and the Fairy Princess. And this movie's existence just really confuses me because first of all, it's five years after the fact that Mariposa came out. And so the Barbie like movie franchise has really taken a turn since then. And I'm just confused as to why now was the time in which they decided to make a sequel. Like obviously when this movie first came out, I feel like it was clear that they were maybe going to take it in like a series sort of route where they were gonna make multiple movies, um, but they didn't. And so to do it now, I just feel like it's kind of like it's just wrong place wrong time like we had already moved on don't remind us of the good movies that used to be you know but anyways this movie follows Mary Posa and she goes on this journey to the crystal fairy realm to cure racism as I said last time uh no basically there was like animosity between the crystal fairies and the butterfly fairies and so they sent Mary Posa to go and like make peace um, and she does. And she also does this in a way that like the two of them bond and the kingdoms are united. There's a great song in this movie. It's called Only a Breath Away. And that's about all I had to say about that. Then we have Barbie and her sisters in a ponytail. Like I said, I'm not the biggest fan of the sisters franchise. So maybe I'm the wrong person to talk about this movie, but nonetheless, uh, it follows Barbie and her sisters going to this riding academy to visit their aunt, not Aunt Millicent. This is another aunt and this aunt has horses. Um, while there, Barbie discovers this magical race of horses called the Majestique. I still to this day don't really know what makes them so magical besides the fact that they have pink streaks and are wild horses. But I feel like last time people were like, Caitlin, they weren't magical, they were just wild. But like, I'm pretty sure in the movie it was like, oh, they're like a myth and we're not too sure if they exist or not. And then Barbie's like, oh, the Majestique. And then the villain is like, the Majestique, I want them. So like, obviously there was something special about them. They just never really explained what that was. And that's okay, I guess. Basically this villain is like, I'm a, take all your land and take all the horses and I'm gonna win the competition. And with the money I win, that's how I'm gonna do those things. And so Barbie's like, nah, -uh, not on my watch. So she takes this magic sea horse that she really bonded with and she ends up competing with that horse in the final competition and they win and save the ranch. I've never really been that into horses. I'm actually allergic to horses. Maybe that's why I just don't really care for them. Um, but I guess if you're more of like a horse girly, this movie might be for you, but then also maybe not because like, wouldn't you be against the whole like taking a wild horse and forcing them to compete for your like competition thing? Like, I feel like that's frowned upon in the horse community, but you guys like, feel free to educate me in the comments below. Also, and the song in this movie, I think it's called You're the One. 
It is good. I like it. Uh, moving on, we have Pearl Princess. This is the movie that I famously said was basically like Rapunzel, but with fish. Um, and yeah, that's basically what it is. Uh, we follow Lumina, who is this mermaid who was kidnapped as a baby. And then she goes on this journey because she wants to go to this royal ball. And then when she gets there, she discovers that she was the lost princess. So lost princess alert, here we are again. One thing that I do really like about this movie is that the villain is redeemed by the end of it. And she's still like looked at as a good mother figure to Lumina, which I think was really sweet. Oh, also the song from this movie that is good is called Light Up the World. I would recommend listening to that one because I like it very much. Up next, and I think is the last one from this era. Yep, okay, uh, is Secret Door. This movie follows Princess Alexa, who is this like bookworm. She's not like other girls. Um, and so she one day discovers this door in her garden and it brings her into this magical world in which magic exists and in this world currently this villain Malusha is stealing everybody's magic so like all the mythical creatures all the fairies all the mermaids are no longer fairy or mermaid because she's taking all of their magic and when she does that it takes away their magical abilities and so another thing about this world is that all the princesses in it have magic so now that Alexa is in this world she has magic because she is a princess um, and so she's able to use her magic to fight against Malusha and she wins. This movie is also a musical. I personally don't really love any of the songs in this movie. There's this one song, I've Got Magic, it plays way too much does not need as many reprises as it has, in my opinion. I do enjoy Malusha's song in this movie. It's called I Want It All. And I feel like that's probably the best song from this movie. Overall, I don't know. I feel like the concept was there. It could have been good, but I hate the color design of this movie. I just feel like it overall looks kind of ugly. Oh yes, I did also want to talk about the doll from this movie because I feel like if memory serves me correctly, I'm pretty sure I ranked it as like the lowest Barbie movie doll when I did my doll ranking, but Nonetheless, let's look at her, shall we? Okay, so here is Princess Alexa. I'll give you guys a closer look at her. She is quite the doll. She almost like, like it looks like she's got candy on her skirt. Why are you, stop it. <laughs> right, the, like it's giving like peppermint for some reason. And like, obviously top is plastic. This is just such a bad material. Um, her gimmick is that she sings when you raise her arm and I'm pretty sure her dress lights up. So get ready for that. Oh, that was lackluster. <laughs> oh, there we go. What? <laughs> ah, okay. So yeah, that's Alexa. I don't like this doll. I'm sorry. She's just so stiff. And I just realized too, like the plastic flowers on her dress, like no. This was a low for Barbie movie dolls and Barbies everywhere. Disgrace. But her face is kind of cute, so she's got that going for her. Okay, so this brings us to 2015, which is an era in which YouTube is booming. And so Mattel decides to take advantage of that, and we see many series come to light, most notably the Barbie vlog series and the Barbie Dreamtopia series. So starting off with the Barbie vlogs. So they first began in 2015, and they all featured Barbie and her friends doing various challenges, tutorials, and just other like slice of life videos. And I feel like a main reason why this series has seen such success throughout the years is because it was a way for Barbie to be able to talk about more like serious topics in a genuine and like personable way. So like during the Black Lives Matter movement, Barbie invited her friend Nikki on her channel and she talked about her experience with racism in a way that the younger audience would understand. She's also done videos where she highlights that it's okay to feel down sometimes. And there's also this really great video where she talks about how often girls say sorry as a reflex and she challenges her viewers to maybe change that word with something else. And she talks about how with young girls specifically, it can oftentimes hurt their self-confidence by saying sorry so often. And then on the lighter side of things, there was of course so many other videos that were just fun and enjoyable. Like the ones with her and Ken were really fun to watch because it was just so obvious that he was head over heels for her. And it was fun as like the viewer to watch them because we know them as Barbie and Ken, like obviously they're gonna end up together, but on the show, Barbie's just oblivious and Ken's just her bestie. And it just made for some really great moments. Following year, we saw another series, which was the Barbie Dreamtopia series. And I'm really excited that I got to talk about this series in a video because up until now, I had like no idea what the series was. I knew it existed, but I knew it wasn't a movie. And so therefore I did not care for it. But now I know what it is and I can tell you guys what it is. So basically it follows Chelsea through her many adventures in her world of Dreamtopia. And oftentimes her sister Barbie goes along with her. It definitely appeals to more of a younger audience. I would kind of say that it has a bit of like a Dora vibe to it, which is a very high compliment in my books. And yeah, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised by it. I thought it was really cute. The animation was actually even better than I thought it was gonna be. 
but that could have been because I was going in thinking that the animation was gonna be really bad. And then I was like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> there was one episode in particular that I saw where I really liked the animation in the beginning of it when Chelsea was still in like her real world, like before she went into her Dreamtopia fantasy world. Um, that animation I thought was really good. It almost reminded me of like the animation that we see later in the puppy adventure movie. But yeah, I thought that it was cute. It almost gave me Fairytopia vibes in a way, just with like all of the magical creatures and such. Um, my one complaint I feel like I have with this series would be the doll line. I feel like it's very ugly. The colors are too much. It looks very plastic heavy and not very material heavy. I don't see any articulation and I'm just not a fan of the Dreamtopia line. And I probably will never be a fan of the Dreamtopia line unless it sees many improvements. My main takeaway from this was that I was glad to be educated as to what Dreamtopia was because otherwise I don't think I would have cared enough to look into it. Now there are so many other Barbie YouTube series that I just do not have enough time to cover them and so that's why I chose those two because I feel like they're the main ones that like the general public would know about and so I just have a list here that I'm going to read off to you just to show like how many there are and like don't get me wrong all of these definitely have the views like upwards into the millions or like hundred thousands at least for all of these. I mean probably because Barbie is at the title but like still and so I'm just going to read them off for you. So we've got Barbie Travel Mysteries, Ask Barbie, Barbie Fashion Fun for Everyone, Barbie Magical Dream Camper, Barbie Hashtag Dream House, and the spinoff Barbie Hashtag Dream House Trend House, Barbie Golden Beach High, which I think might have been their response to the whole Rainbow High success, but I have not fact checked that, Barbie Dream Vacation, Barbie Malibu Helpers Club, The Barbie and Barbie Show, Barbie Team Fashion, Barbie Camp Sister Switch, Barbie Fashion Fun, Barbie Dream House Mysteries, Barbie Life in the City, starring the new Barbie Brooklyn, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. My first Barbie with launch with a 40 minute musical special that has currently over 7 million views and then Barbie Summer Adventure and I'm sure many more as that list was literally just from me going through the playlist on the Barbie YouTube channel and grabbing whatever I could. That is the YouTube era from Barbie which is currently going on and so that brings us up to our second last era which I like to call the exploratory era because I feel like each movie in this series kind of takes its own route with things and it's also when I feel like Mattel decided to take all of like the things that would usually be marketed to boys and like Barbieify it. So we've got superheroes, we got sci-fi, spies, video games, like it was all things that would normally be like marketed as a boy thing. Um, and so Barbie took a spin on things and was like, nah, let's make it girly, which I'm not too sure was the correct direction, but it was the approach nonetheless. So first up, we've got Barbie Princess Power. This movie followed Princess Kara, who one day got kissed by a magical butterfly Fly and then gained its superpowers and so she uses them to defeat the villain in the movie um, and then also during this movie her cousin who is kind of like her antagonist also gets kissed by the same butterfly and then she becomes a superhero as well and so they're like competing superheroes but then at the end they have to come together because that's right barbie just loves to do that so much um so they have to come together and work together to defeat this evil villain from taking over the kingdom i feel like i want to say i don't mind this movie but i do i do mind this movie it's bad don't watch it <laughs> Super sparkle. Yeah, you're a superhero. Then we have Rockin' Royals. So this is our third Princess in the Popper remake for those of us that are keeping count. This movie follows Princess Courtney and pop star Erica who are going to summer camp. There are two summer camps. We have the princess camp and then we have the rock star camp. And then, oh no, Erica and Courtney end up switching places. So now they're at the wrong camps. And then they end up having to compete in this like final sing-off competition. But then they end up deciding that, you know what? We're stronger together. So let's work together because no camp should be dead because the whole thing was like that the camp that won would stay the camp that lost would close for good um this one's a musical i always say that it gives like camp rock meets pitch perfect sort of vibes um and the best song from this one is called what if i shine i like this one i feel like it's a good princess and the popper remake good job rock and royals we love to see it this is also arguably barbie's last movie as an actress as every movie from this point on she is just barbie she doesn't have a name she's not playing a character but i say arguably because i still feel like in some movies 
moving forward, she is playing a character, but we'll get to that. So now we have our first puppy movie, which is Barbie and her sisters in The Great Puppy Adventure. This one follows Barbie and her sisters going to visit their grandma for the summer, and then she gifts them with some puppies, so that's the origin of the puppies. Um, and then we find this treasure map, and the girls decide to follow this treasure map, which leads them to gold. I feel like I mentioned this last time, but I'm gonna say it again. The thing that bugs me about this movie is that they say that their grandfather like worked his whole life to try to find this treasure, and then these group of teenagers find it in one week. Other than that, this one's fine. Uh, animation is a huge upgrade, and I really like the animation in this movie, and I wish they would have done this style more moving forward. This is also the last Kelly Sheridan movie, so Barbie is replaced by another voice actress in this movie, and I feel like she remains the voice of Barbie to this day but I could be wrong. Like, I feel like they use the same voice as the Barbie vlogs Barbie, but I'll put a little thing here to say if I'm wrong or right. Right there. Okay. <laughs> Up next, we have Barbie Spy Squad. In this movie, we follow Barbie and her friends as they are gymnasts who get recruited to be spies. At first, they're not very good at being spies, but then they are good at <laughs> being spies by the end, and they end up stopping an evil plot that is made to take over the spy organization. Next, we have Barbie Starlight Adventure, my personal favorite from this era. Now, this is the movie I said that you could argue that Barbie is playing a character, or I feel like you have to argue that Barbie is playing a character here because it exists in this like other sci-fi dimension in which like the planets are different and the environments are different. Like it's clearly a different universe. And so she can't be Barbie unless this is another dimension in which Barbie also exists in. But I personally like to think it's more of like a Hannah Montana situation where she's Barbie playing a character in which her name is also Barbie. And so basically, like I said, this movie takes place in this like sci-fi like world in which the stars are in risk of going out. And so Barbie gets recruited to join this team to be the crew that goes and saves the stars from going out because that would be bad. Um, oh, and she gets recruited because she's a hoverboarder and she's really good at hoverboarding and they're like, oh, we need you on our team. Uh, so she travels to this capital, they train and then they go, I feel like they go twice. They go one time out to outer space and then it doesn't work out because Barbie is like, I can't do this. I can't trap this like innocent animal, which was like this whole other thing. Uh, but then they go again and then she is able to do it. Well, with the help of her friends. Um, they're able to save the stars and it's a happy ending. This movie is also when we see the return of a good sidekick finally. So we have Popcorn, which is Barbie's little like puffball, little guy that flies around. Um, and then Popcorn is kind of like a caterpillar because at the end he puffs into his like true form that he's going to be and he doesn't know what his form is going to be. And then it's like this like space kitten thing, which is like really cool. But then Popcorn's kind of sad because Popcorn was like, I used to be able to fly and now I can't fly. What am I going to do? And then Barbie builds this like contraption for him. I also don't know if he uses he, him pronouns or she, her pronouns. So Popcorn, if I am misgendering you right now, I'm so sorry. I feel like he's a he, but who knows? Anyways, could be a she. I'm getting way off track. <laughs> Barbie makes this like flying contraption for popcorn and then they're now able to fly. I could have just used they them this whole time. Anyways. Oh, it's also not a musical, but there are quite a few songs in this movie. The best one is Shooting Star. There's two versions. They're both good, but I particularly really like the acoustic version. Last thing, this was the doll I chose for this era because she was a huge hit when I did my like Barbie doll video. So let me grab her. So unfortunately, while she was in storage, her arm broke, <laughs> but you guys can still get the gist and she does still do her fun trick. So this is Barbie from Starlight Adventure. She looks like this. Um, she's, yeah, very much so not articulated, not, I don't know, decent quality for what she is, which is not really a doll. She's just um, a mechanism to do this fun trick, which I will do. Basically you press this button on her back and then popcorn flies. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, I think I found it. Okay, ready? Oh, I didn't find it. I lied. Where is it? Okay. Yeah! Look at that! Isn't that fun? So basically my point with showing her was just the fact that like this was like when Barbie was like really with the gimmicks. They were like pulling out all the stops. Not any of the stops to like make a good doll but just like the stops to like make a good gimmick. They said these dolls are gonna do one thing and one thing only, and they did that. And this is just your example of that.
So yeah, that's a Starlight Adventure. Up next, we have the movie that I ranked the lowest when I ranked all the Barbie movies however long ago. And although I have not revisited this film since, I would still stand by that statement 100%. I do still think it is bad. Basically, we follow Barbie and her sisters as they travel to Hawaii for a dance competition that Chelsea is having. But then while there, their puppies get lost and then they get lost trying to find them. And so we see them stranded and Barbie not be a very good leader for some reason because I don't know, she just forgot who she is for a second. I guess. Um, but then everything works out in the end because they do make it back in time for her dance competition and Chelsea gets to dance with some horses. So there is that. If you're wondering why I didn't like this movie, I don't know, go watch my last video. <laughs> Actually, no. Um, I feel like my main points were that Barbie is not Barbie in this movie. She's very out of character. She's not the responsible sister that we know and love. Also, it's just so frustrating to watch them time and time again, try to get back and then just constantly be failing. And there was also this whole subplot with the puppies and what they were doing, which I just couldn't care less about. And so, yeah. But there was the dancing horses though, which is just still such a interesting aspect about this movie for me. Next, we have Video Game Hero. So this movie followed Barbie after she got sucked into a video game. She had to complete these different levels to defeat this virus from taking over the game. One thing that I did like about this movie was the different animation styles that it had for each level of the game and that they all kind of paid homage to various genres of video games. And I also really liked the Just Dance product placement and I feel like it made for some really great moments. You know what's fun? Your favorite game. Just Dance. So then we have our last Barbie movie before the big Barbie movie hiatus from 2017 to 2020, which is Barbie Dolphin Magic. And so this movie tied into the Barbie vlogs as well as the upcoming Barbie Dreamhouse Adventure series. It basically follows Barbie and her sisters traveling to this tropical island in which Ken is there on this marine biology internship. But then we come to find out that his mentor lady is actually evil and is stealing these magical dolphins. She meets this magical mermaid girl who is not a mermaid at first, but then she discovers that she is a mermaid and it's this big thing. You can't can't trust humans, you know? Humans? I mean, people. What is this? Uh, bread? Mmm, oh, I love bread. It's so mm, dry. <laughs> You're quirky. And the two of them, along with her sisters, work together to free the magical dolphins from Ken's evil boss. And I like this movie. I really like the aesthetic and I remember having a good time watching it. So then we have 2018, which is when we had the Barbie Dreamhouse Adventure series, as well as its spinoff, Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures Go Team Roberts. So this series was released on Netflix, kind of filled the Barbie movie whole, as like I said, we were in like a hiatus of movies from 2017 to 2020, which was very rare in terms of Barbie movies, because up until now, like since 2001, we've had movies come out every single year, oftentimes with multiple movies per year. And so in 2017, for there just to be no movies coming out, that was like a wild time. That's actually when I released my Barbie movie video or like around that time. And I remember thinking like, man, this is a good time to release that video because there's been no movies, which is like a wild thing. Um, but then obviously they do come back, which was good. But also I was like, man, like now my video isn't relevant. I mean, it is relevant, but like I'm missing movies now, you know? Anyways, Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures. So this show was released on Netflix. And like I said, it tied into the Barbie vlogs. So it had Barbie as a narrator shooting like a YouTube video throughout the episodes. And it was basically just about this new version of Barbie's everyday life. Apparently the show was created as a response from fans wanting to know more about like what this new Barbie's everyday life was like. And so that's how Dreamhouse Adventures came to be. And then Dreamhouse Adventures Go Team Roberts was basically the same thing. I'm not really too sure why they added that tagline instead of just like making a new season. Um, I'd say the main difference between the two series was that like Go Team Roberts was more so like a continuation or like they weren't so like one-off plot lines. Like oftentimes they would have like an episode arc that lasted three episodes. I actually watched the whole like mermaid story arc of Go Team Roberts one time when I was just like browsing Netflix. I'm not really too sure why. I think I was just curious. Um, and I enjoyed it. So now I move on to 2020, which is our current era of Barbie movies. So we have six to go over in this era and they're all basically an extension of the Barbie vlog series and the Barbie dream host series in which they take Barbie and her friends and put them into extraordinary situations. So first up we have Princess Adventure. So now we are at the fourth remake of Princess and the Popper. But honestly, I'm not complaining because I feel like this remake was pretty good and it was a good return to the series. As like I said, this is the first movie we had since 2017. So in this movie, we follow Barbie and her friends as they go on an exchange program to this other kingdom in which we meet Princess Amelia and come to discover that her and Barbie are identical. And so they decide to switch places and see what the other person's life is like. And then while doing so, they end up uncovering an evil plot against the crown that they have to stop. Um, this movie is also a musical and I personally feel like it's a good one 
one. It's got a lot of great songs. My personal favorites are King of the Kingdom and Life in Color. I and mean, it was also really fun to see Ken in this movie and his crush for Barbie. And as far as Princess and the Popper remakes go, like I said, I feel like this one is a good one. And I feel like it has a lot of Easter eggs to the original movie, which is something that I really like. Up next, we have Barbie and Chelsea, The Lost Birthday. And so this was the first movie in which we had Chelsea at the lead for a change instead of Barbie. And so this movie follows their whole family going on this cruise in which they cross the international dateline. And then by crossing that dateline, they end up skipping Chelsea's birthday. And so she's really upset. She goes and sulks about it in this um, lifeboat. And then she ends up having this dream where she goes on this grand adventure to try to get her birthday back. And I feel like anyone who watched my review of this movie already kind of knows my thoughts on it, which is that I didn't love it, but mainly just because it wasn't for me. It was very much so geared to a younger audience. And I feel like I probably would have been better prepared for that if I had knowledge of the Dreamtopia series going into this one, because then I would have been like, oh, so like every time Chelsea's at the lead, it just, it's going to be geared to a younger audience, which is just something I didn't know till now, but now I know. So that's great. Up next, we have Barbie Big City Big Dreams. And so this is when the whole Barbie franchise as a whole really took a turn. Basically, this movie follows Barbie as she travels to New York to partake in this performing arts program. And once she gets there, she meets Barbie Roberts. And so we now have this new character in universe who is also named Barbie Roberts and who also is now Barbie. And so the two of them become friends and realize they have a lot more in common than just their names. Um, they also end up going by these new nicknames. So uh, the original Barbie that we know is now called Malibu and this new Barbie is now called Brooklyn. This movie is also a musical and it has a great soundtrack. I love See You at the Finish Line, Good Vibes, Before Us. They're all so good, except for Work It. We don't talk about that one. I mean, unless you want to hear what could arguably be one of the worst Barbie movie songs ever made, I would not recommend checking out that song. So notably, this movie introduces Brooklyn, who has kind of become a household name within the current Barbie movie lore. She is in every movie after this one. Barbie and her go on to have a few spinoff series on YouTube, as well as a Netflix series that I will get to. Obviously, she was done to create further diversity within the Barbie line and also just alter what we think of when we immediately think about Barbie in general. Um, but I personally have my own theory when it comes to Brooklyn, okay? Are we ready? Okay, so if you'll remember, back when the earlier movies were coming out and they had the doll lines that went along with it, a lot of times they didn't have much representation in the earlier Barbie movies, and so instead they would just create black versions of those dolls and sell them as like the same character, but it would be the black version of like Annalise or Erica or Odette. And so what if that version of Barbie's timeline is now colliding with our current version of Barbie's timeline to create a synergy Barbie timeline. <laughs> and I feel like I like this theory because it further validates the previous versions of Barbies that we've had throughout the years. Um, but yeah, that's just a fan theory, my fan theory, and I like it. Okay, moving on. <laughs> and so now we're at 2022, Barbie and Barbie have their own spinoff show now called It Takes Two, which is on Netflix. It's basically a spinoff of Big City Big Dreams and it just follows their adventures in New York, uh, studying theater and whatnot. Then we have Barbie Mermaid Power. This is our sixth mermaid movie for those of you who are keeping count. And it's also kind of a sequel to Dolphin Magic as the same mermaid from Dolphin Magic is in this movie. So this movie follows Barbie and Barbie as well as her sister sisters as they get transformed into mermaids and end up competing to become the mermaid power keeper in this like mermaid kingdom. If you'll recall, I was a bit harsh, I feel like on this movie during my review of it, but I honestly think it's fine for what it is. And I think it creates some fun storylines for kids to imagine, you know? like when they're playing mermaids in the pool and whatnot. <laughs> I was also gonna talk about the doll for this line. This was the one I chose to show for this era because if you'll remember, I was a little bit disappointed with this line in the beginning, but I do like Brooklyn's and they have since come out with dolls of the other sisters and I like those ones as well. So let me grab Brooklyn. Okay, here she is. So she is in no way like I'd say as good as like the original Barb movie dolls, but she's definitely a turn in the right direction, I'd say. Like, I love her color scheme. I love her long, curly hair, and her tail is pretty fun. You can also take this part off. I don't really remember why. <laughs> I guess if you just want to have a shorter tail. Um, and so, yeah, she's pretty. And I do feel like the quality is coming back around on Mattel, which is a turn in the right direction. I love to see that. And I really like Brooklyn. I really like her little freckles on her face. I don't know if you'll be able to see them, but they're so cute and I love them. So yeah, 
that's the doll line from this era. Next we have Barbie Epic Road Trip, which is our first interactive film. So it's kind of like a choose your own adventure sort of thing at various parts throughout the movie. Two options will come up where you get to choose what direction the characters go in. And yeah, it's a road trip movie. So they're traveling it to New York. But I feel like one of the most notable things about it is that it's the movie in which Barbie and Ken, at least this version of Barbie and Ken, finally get together. And so I don't want to spoil it in case you want to go and watch it for yourself. But there's this really great moment in which he confesses his feelings to her and they share a kiss on the Ferris wheel. And there's this really good moment in which he gives her a bracelet that has sea glass on it from a time in which they first met, which I just think is so adorable and just proves why this version of Ken is such a lovely version of Ken and I love him. He's great. Okay, so now we are caught up to our most recent movie, which is Barbie and Skipper in the Big Bay Sitting Adventure. And so this movie follows Skipper at the head this time and she's working at this water park and she's having like these various jobs, but none of them are really working. And then she comes up with the idea of turning this gaming bus into this like babysitting place where like the younger kids who are a bit too young to go on all these water park rides can go and have a good time with Skipper babysitting them. Um, but then chaos ensues and they end up stranded and they have to use their babysitting skills to get back to the water park. The ending of this movie also hints at the upcoming Barbie movie, which is going to feature Stacy at the lead. I forget what it's called, but it's Barbie and Stacy doing something. I personally didn't really enjoy this one. I remember like texting my boyfriend while I was watching it and being mad because Barbie isn't even in it. I get it, this is Skipper's movie, but you can't put Barbie in the title and then not even have her in it. She was in it for like five seconds and then she was gone and that made me sad. And honestly, she's the reason why I watch these movies, okay? And so you take her out of them and then I'm not interested. And so now we're all caught up to 2023 in which we have our very first live action Barbie movie being released in theaters currently. You can go see it now, which is so cool. It's kind of like a revolutionary moment. Like this movie is making so much money and doing so well and I'm so happy for it. I personally love the movie. It's the first time Barbie has made a movie for the older audience that grew up with Barbie as opposed to the younger audience that's currently enjoying Barbie and I feel like they did a great job. I mean, if you're a fan of the Barbie movies, you might be a bit disappointed as there isn't really any reference or even Easter egg to the original movies, which did make me a little bit sad, but also I was expecting that as this movie isn't about the animated movie it's about the doll line. They do show the Barbie Mermaid Power logo and so I guess that kind of counts because that is a Barbie movie and I guess that would be a direct reference to the animated movies but at the same time it doesn't hit as hard because it isn't a reference to the original movies and also I personally just saw that as them referencing Dua Lipa's character as she played like a generic Barbie mermaid in the movie but yeah as a Barbie fan I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I cried numerous times which I didn't think would be the norm like once more people started to see it and they were also saying that they were crying during it I was like oh, okay, so I was supposed to be crying. I just thought I was weird and like way too obsessed with this franchise that it just kept making me emotional, but turns out I was not alone in that. So that made me happy. I was not expecting Alan to be my highlight of this movie, but he definitely was. I remember leaving the movie theater and being like, man, he was so funny and I loved him so much. One of my few complaints about this movie isn't even the movie's fault. And it was just that I felt like I was shown too much of the movie going into it. Like I even tried my best to avoid trailers after like I watched the main trailer, but then after that I stopped watching any snippets. But then I went to like the bar Barbie blow up party that was like a early release like on the Wednesday before the movie came out and before the movie they showed all of the trailers that I had been avoiding and so I was basically subject to them um, and yeah I just felt like a numerous jokes and stuff I had already been spoiled of and I wanted to go in a bit more fresh than that but other than that I loved this movie I loved everything about it I highly recommend checking it out and I'm sure most of you who are watching have already seen it and will probably agree with me, especially if you're up to this part of the video, unless you skip to this part, which I guess I didn't factor in the fact that that could have also been a thing that people do. In that case, hello, welcome. I hope you watch, I don't know, some of the other parts of this video because I worked hard on it. I guess that's all. We have reached the end. So yes, I will do my outro now. <laughs> Anyways, Kater Todd, that is all I have to say for today. I hope you'll have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you very, very soon. Okay, wait, I do have one other thing to say, which is that I have absolutely no idea what the title of this video is gonna be. So if it's like major clickbait, I apologize. I just don't know what to do. And I work so hard in this video and I'm just like, I need to get it out there. I need the people to see, even if the people end up seeing it and are like, this isn't what I wanted it to be and click away, that's okay. That's okay. I just need to make sure that all of my efforts pay off. And so that is that. Um, and honestly, my brain is kind of going in the realm of like the new Barbie movie disrespects the Barbie cinematic universe, which like, I do agree that it does. Like. There was no mention of the Barbie animated movies, the movies that have like put Mattel on the map as far as I'm concerned, the movies that every time I talk about always get me like millions of views. Like these movies have a following, these movies have an impact. And the fact that there wasn't like a smidge of an Easter egg, 
like a little the bitty smidge it kind of pisses me off, I'm not gonna lie. And so if that is the way in which I decide to title this video, there is your explanation. That is why I did that. Okay, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> oh, I did like a Barbie with the piece and that wasn't even intentional. It just came out of me. Um, I didn't like the way I worded that. <laughs> I'm sorry.